Uh, good afternoon. We're, we're going to be talking about the education of our children today, but before just a bit of, uh, I think, some good news from our nation's capital. I was just on a call with President-elect uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, and uh, they had some good news uh, about their commitment to our vaccine rollout effort. Uh, I was happy to see uh, President-elect talking about the education of our children and heard some good uh, commitments to continue the effort to help our states in uh, there are multiple challenges in the vaccine rollout and some of our other efforts. I have also was pleased to see that uh, a friend, Gina McCarthy, has been appointed as a White House Climate Coordinator. She's fantastic. She'll be just tremendous in that, uh, given her experience at the Environmental Protection Agency. And former Michigan Governor Jennifer Granholm, to, uh, chosen as Energy Secretary, her experience with manufacturing auto industry uh, has really suited her well to this position. So we've got some good news from Washington, D.C. We're very hopeful that Congress will produce a strong package in the next several hours and days to, uh, to help us through our troubled times. So on to talk about the education of our children. Uh, as you know, this week we've been rolling out our budget uh, and policy proposals for the next legislative session. Today, uh, we'd like to talk about uh, COVID-19 and specifically how it affects our students and our ability to advance their education. And I come to this issue uh, with multiple perspectives. Um, I'm the father of three. I'm the grandfather of four. I'm the son of a teacher. I am the brother of a teacher. I'm the brother-in-law of two teachers. I spend much time listening to uh, parents and students and educators and community members in the last several weeks. And this, uh, this we know. Uh, we know that because of the new science we have and because of the successful experience we've had in various schools, it is time to begin the process of getting more of our students back into the classroom. And we believe we can do this successfully. So today I'm announcing changes to our school health and safety toolkit that helps guide local decision making as they consider these options. This is based on our new uh, data that has given us high confidence and shows that schools can successfully limit the transmission of COVID-19 when they have strong safe, uh, health and safety protocols in place in their schools. I've spoken with leaders in school districts both east and west of the Cascades in places like Lake Washington and King County, Meade in Spokane County, Moses Lake in Grant County, uh, about the, their success. And we know that uh, no place where two humans are, are, ever are, that there is no place where there is zero risk. We are very confident that our health and safety measures diminish the risk enough both to uh, uh, students and educators, to make it reasonable to begin this transition back into the classroom. So this is good and encouraging news, both for our educators and uh, who want to get back to work in a safe and healthy environment, for parents who, whose lives certainly have been disrupted, and for students whose lives uh, in educationally have been significantly diminished in, in many cases. You know, many people's lives revolve around a regular school schedule. And apart from the academics, we know that schools provide social supports that advance uh, healthy childhood development. The pandemic earlier this year forced us to take unprecedented steps to close schools for in-person learning. Uh, still, it's estimated that only about 15% of our 1.2 million K through 12 students are receiving any form of in-person uh, learning right now. So I have sought the opinions of state and local education administrators, educators, uh, uh, professional staff, parents and school boards about what the next steps are for the education of our students. And today we are providing them a way to incrementally get more students back into the classroom. And these suggestions are based on demonstrated success of these health and safety protocols, beginning with our youngest students. 
and I know some would have liked to have seen this sooner, but we have data and research now that we did not have six months ago or three months ago. And that information is robust and from multiple uh, sources. I want to just share some of the scientific data we have upon which we're basing these recommendations. I'm very heartened by the recent data and research, both from national experts at MIT, uh, Brown University and Harvard, and from experts here in Washington. We have had a few infections transmitted in our schools, but most have been relatively small with two to five cases, including in counties where COVID activity is actually very high uh, at the moment. So I'd like to s just show you a graphic of some of the research that's been done uh, comparing the risk factors in schools where no safety and health measures in place and places where you do have safety and health measures in place for on-site instruction. And also comparing uh, uh, on-site instruction with remote instruction. Uh, the, uh, the bars on the left uh, essentially show uh, effective reproductive numbers. That's the number of people who are infected for every person who's infected, how many they infect. In the assumption that uh, you have all in-person and no countermeasures, so it's just regular school with no different protocols. And you'll, and under three different assumptions, three different scientific assumptions about the transmission rate amongst children that represent the three different colored bars. You'll see that uh, for all in-person, no countermeasures, it goes from a, an r naught number of about 1.15 to about 1.3. Here's a really interesting part. The, the remaining bars to the right uh, compare uh, all in-person instruction with safety protocols, which is the second set of bars, with comparing it to all remote, which is the, the bars on the right side of the screen. And then it's sort of a, a gradient of different gradients between those two. And the thing that is quite impressive is that they, they differ very, very little. That has been um, an important consideration in our recommendations because it indicates that, that there really is relatively small additional risk if you have good safety and health protocols. And we see it as our task to make sure that when our students go back, when our educators go back, that in fact we follow these sound practices of health and safety protocols to keep people safe. And when we do that, we now have both that scientific data I've just shown you and experience to give us high confidence. We've held students and educators well-being foremost in our minds, of course, but we're confident that these risks are reasonable, again, as long as we adhere, adhere to health and safety measures, like wearing masks, maintaining uh, uh, six feet uh, of physical distance, increasing cleaning and improved ventilation, and there are obviously a number of other things that we need to do too. So now that we have a better understanding of how the disease spreads and have developed health and safety protocols specific to schools, we are in a much better position and we have much more confidence when it comes to a phased in, in-person learning. Now, there's a couple other comments about why this is the right approach. One is that the, the, the innovation, the creativity, the diligence of our educators has been extraordinary the last few months. I've seen it myself uh, watching the education of some young ones remotely. And what the teachers are doing right now is just astounding. To, to find new creative ways to keep the intention of, you know, six, seven, eight-year-olds. That is quite a task. And they're just doing yeoman work across the state of Washington in this regard. And many of our students are doing quite well in the remote learning situation. But we know that there's great inequities in our society uh, on the ability to have connectivity, to have people that, to help with the students in the home on a remote basis. And so the inequities that we've always suffered in education have been even more pronounced, despite the incredible work that our teachers are doing. So 
this is something if we're going to reduce inequities, it's important to to do safe things to get some of our students back on site uh, learning. So for this reason, uh, I have approved new recommendations by our Department of Health for a phased return to in-person learning uh, using some new uh, yardsticks, some new health metrics. So using what we've learned from the data, we are making revisions to our guidance for returning to in-person learning. Uh, these parts of our plan are recommendations as to when to return more students. They are not requirements. They are not legally binding. They are recommendations. As governor, I have the authority to close schools, or actually the Department of Health, for emergencies. I do not have the statutory authority to make them reopen. Those reopening decisions remain matters of local communities and local school boards uh, making those decisions about how to bring students back uh, into on-site learning. But we do think uh, these recommendations can be helpful uh, for a springboard for discussion in these communities. So here's what our recommendations are. Once the required safety measures are in place, when COVID cases represent less than 50 uh, residents per 100,000 in the district. In-person learning uh, should be available uh, to all students. Well, cases are greater than 50 per 100,000, but less than 350. Districts are encouraged to phase uh, in in-person learning starting with elementary and middle school students. We recommend beginning with the youngest students and those with the highest needs first. Older students should be among the last cohorts to return to in-person learning. That's because older students, like high schoolers, are more similar to adults in terms of how they catch and transmit the virus. And here's an interesting uh, fact. The data has shown that it's actually easier to get younger children to adhere to health protocols than older students. All of us who've raised teenagers have some experience with that phenomenon. Uh, bringing high schoolers back into the classroom uh, is not recommended at this moment before uh, the area sees a plateau and dec or decrease in cases within those, those metrics. So where COVID cases are greater than 350 per 100,000 residents, districts are encouraged to bring elementary students and those with the highest needs into the classroom in small groups. A small group we can considered about 15 students or fewer. Our teachers and school administrators, as I've said, have done a phenomenal job navigating uh, these challenges. And this updated guidance provides a framework which will help students and educators plan and prepare when these metrics reach these appropriate levels so that they are able to resume uh, in-person education when that moment arrives. I do note as well that these are recommendations under today's conditions, but we believe, we think there's every reason to be confident that as we open up more of our on-site learning, starting with the younger students, we will see uh, successes that will give uh, both the community and parents and educators more confidence that this can be done safely and will lead to increasing usage of on-site uh, learning as we see the experience develop. And the reason we believe that is by looking at the multiple places where this is succeeding today. And we'll have a little more discussion about that. Now, along with the recommendations on when to return more students to class, we are releasing today a proclamation reinforcing the fact that our state and health and safety protocols are required by law in schools. These protocols are not just recommendations. They are binding requirements. And they have to be followed safely if we're going to return our, our students. So this is an important thing to recognize. This is a binding, mandatory requirement. And it's important that it be followed. Because if we're going to have confidence for parents, students, and educators, we got to make sure that we're actually hewing to the safety uh, protocols that we know actually do work. So to, in order to assure that, 
um, our, we're having our Department of Labor and Industries designate a single point of contact within the Division of Occupational Safety and Health to serve as a liaison for school workplace safety questions and concerns, helping us to ensure confidence in adherence to these protocols. This could lead to enhanced inspections if, in fact, uh, we hear evidence or, or complaints that these uh, measures are not being followed. And what we have found in listening to educators and parents across the state is that schools and districts that have had adherence to these uh, requirements have relatively quickly won the confidence of their community and their educators to move forward in this regard. And that's why we emphasize this. And this is why this is such an important part of this plan to get our, our students uh, more back into school. So um, we had something I wanted to refer to. We had our health and safety measures was up on the screen, but I probably have covered that, I think. So we're going to move on also to that end so that we can have higher confidence that these safety measures will be in place. I'm directing $3 million in federal CARES Act funds to school districts to support safety planning in districts, specifically those with a demonstrable need for more financial support to meet these requirements. Our schools need the expertise to be able to do this. They need to have people to uh, to act as advisors and liaisons and contact tracers so that everybody, including educators, has confident, confidence that this is being done safely. Now, these funds will be allocated by the Office of Superintendent of Public Ed Instruction. And to talk more about what they'll do with these funds, I'm joined by State Superintendent Chris Rakel, who, uh, who is going to talk about that and perhaps any other opinions he has at this moment. Chris. Thank you, Governor Inslee, and appreciate everyone's uh, time here today. I'm Superintendent of Public Instruction, Chris Ray-McDoll. Thank you for being with us in this critical announcement. I want to thank our partners also at the Department of Health and Labor and Industries. This, this bit of work over the last nine months has been uh, nothing short of uh, remarkable with respect to how much coordination has to go on, and these are incredible partners under the leadership of the governor. We are a state that has been driven by data, and uh, we've taken that very seriously from moment one. And I think we've built a uh, track record about that around the country. I think we've built confidence in folks that this is not um, decision-making uh, made out of rhetoric, uh, not out of anecdote, uh, but out of research and data. And again, thank you to the Department of Health who has poured through the research and the literature, who's found the evidence of success and failures globally uh, in other states and the successes in our state here. Um, no better proof of the leadership of the governor and this state being serious about this than the fact that we're 2.4% of the U.S. population, uh, but we're only about 1% of the U.S. mortalities uh, that, uh, that has stemmed from COVID-19. Though we were ground zero for it, we were one of the first states who had to respond and did it uh, diligently. I, I lead with that because folks need to know that the transformation that's happening here and has been happening is still a function of data. Uh, we take that very seriously, and that's what leads us to this place today. We have some of the most stringent health and safety protocols for school opening in the country. We issued those in June. They remain hand hygiene, cleaning, screening students and staff every day, six foot of physical distancing, and face covering. Uh, many, many states have adopted that or in some form of it. Uh, we now know from the research that that, when implemented with fidelity, creates tremendous success to keep cases at or near zero in school districts or in school building settings, even as cases might be climbing um, in a general community or in a general populace. The face covering and physical distancing in particular is so critical to this. Um, we also know that uh, when we do it well, we get uh, much better results. Attendance, student engagement, uh, and just that general sense of the purpose of our schools and why they're there. They're whole child systems. They're more than academic, transformation. It's more than content delivery. Our schools are where we have our nurses, our mental health supports, our physical engagement, our social emotional learning. Our schools are centers of excellence around young child development, uh, more so than just the content. We know they're struggling right now. Students across the state uh, in pretty unprecedented ways are struggling despite the unbelievable efforts of educators to build remote learning systems. 
uh, in a very remarkably short period of time. We have connected uh, 300,000 more families uh, with devices and or connectivity. We've done everything we can and educators did everything that was asked of them in this time. But the system simply doesn't work for too many kids, not for its inability to reach hard to families, but because you're asking 1.1, 1.2 million young people to be independent learners. The best universities in the world who are highly selective do not use online models as their primary delivery system. It's what we had to do in a crisis in the absence of data and information. We were never going to experiment with children and educators in this state. Safety first, and it remains the priority. But we know a lot more today. We know a lot more today due to the research that's gone on. Um, the governor shared the priorities, uh, early learning first for sure, kindergarten through fifth grade, the opportunity to go much faster than that for middle and high school students as cases come down as we demonstrate success in schools. We have many districts open today for K-12 uh, who are doing that successfully. I would add that a priority group of students that is also consistent with the guidance that is delivered here uh, immediately are students who are really struggling. Uh, English language learners, students with disabilities, uh, students who have disproportionately been impacted by remote learning, who are struggling mentally, emotionally, and academically. Uh, these need to be priorities for our districts and they need to be priorities now. The 350 metric is very important, but as the governor indicated, these are local decisions. The statute is very clear that our locally elected boards who are absolutely unbelievable in this time, and, and, and with respect to the complexity of what they're weighing, they have to make the determination to move forward under these guidelines. Um, education can occur and phase in even above 350, but obviously we need everyone in our communities to double down. In April and in May, this state did remarkable things. Following our physical distancing and our face coverings, we got case down dramatically. We have to have that kind of diligence now, um, and we have to do it in partnership with our schools. The, the, the unbelievable um, and heroic work of our educators is where I want to conclude. Uh, when you get into the teaching system, when you when you decide you want to be an educator or a paraeducator or a bus driver or somebody in custodial, uh, somebody delivering meals, a principal, a superintendent, you want to work with young people. Your life's work is developing young people. And right now, it is a tough time for a lot of students and families, and it is a remarkably tough time for educators. Uh, staring at a screen, lots of cameras off, uh, looking at young people who you know want to be connected, um, being gracious to try to lift them up socially and emotionally when you can't be there to give them a high five or a fist bump or a hug. This is soul crushing for a lot of folks. And given what we know now about social emotional impacts and academic impacts and our ability to be super safe when opening schools has been demonstrated by the research and actual practices in the state, uh, I am urging all districts to double down their efforts today labor and management, sitting down immediately to focus on reopening. As you have planned, many of you, for late January, maybe early February at your break, um, be, be relentless about your plan, get to the work of it, follow the safety protocols, um, and, and take note that we are in the business of serving young people and they need us right now, uh, and we can do this safely. Chris, thanks for your leadership. It particularly resonates with me describing educators as her heroic during this time. I do not believe that is an overstatement. Uh, teachers are, you know, they're spending enormous amounts of their personal energy trying to figure out the best way to engage students remotely. I've seen it. I appreciate it. And we all ought to appreciate educators' efforts during this period of time. And now we are very hopeful that we can ease their burdens by giving them a safe way to, to be closer physically to their students. Because I've, I haven't talked to any educators who, if we can do it safely, would rather do it on a remote basis. So thanks for your comments, Chris. I appreciate them. As a guy who watched my dad, you know, um, correcting papers when I went to bed Sunday night, and he was working till midnight, I, I appreciate what they're doing for us. Uh, there's some other things we can do and should consider. We want to, uh, to support the expansion of testing for COVID positivity in our schools, students and educators, uh, consistent with the Department of Health guidance that's being released today. Uh, we have about uh, 
oh, more than a dozen pilot programs regarding using that testing, antigen testing. And we are hopeful that we can uh, expand that as our supplies of these tests become, become more um, acceptable or more available. To talk about that, we have Lacey Fehrenbach, Deputy Secretary for COVID Response for State Department of Health. Lacey. Thank you, Governor, and want to start by acknowledging how very difficult this journey has been for everyone, teachers, young people, parents, school administrators. Um, the superintendent uh, spoke very well about the innovation that this has required of you and the patience it has required of you. And I want to echo um, my appreciation and our appreciation for all of the support you are providing um, our next generation of Washingtonians. You are all public health heroes. We care deeply about Washington's children and we want them to be in school, learning face-to-face, -face, seeing their friends, getting all of those social, emotional, um, physical health and educational benefits that in-person learning provides. We also want and need to protect the health of um, school students and staff and the families they go home to at the end of the day, as well as the broader uh, community during the midst of this pandemic. This has been our goal since the beginning and will continue to be our goal as we navigate through this together. Um, we did, um, as you know, release guidance earlier this summer. And I want to emphasize that that was based on the information that we had. And at the time we were focused on protecting health and we took a cautious approach. However, as the fall months went on, uh, some schools here in Washington and many schools across the country began providing in-person learning and we've learned from that. And so we're in a new place today. Uh, here in Washington over the first quarter of the school year, data collected on uh, transmission in the school has shown that the health and safety measures taken seem to be limiting the spread of infection within the school environment. And as an example, um, you know, one of the things we look at are outbreaks. And I want to remind people that an outbreak can be small, two cases. Um, uh, and, and what you really are measuring here are cases where transmission happened in that environment. So in this case, in a school. In areas where the, trans, the, the community rate of COVID is higher, we do see more outbreaks. However, the majority of these outbreaks have been very small. Half of them have had three or fewer cases. This is similar to what we see nationally. This is a strong sign that all of those things we're asking schools to do um, are working. Masks, distancing, increased cleaning, improved ventilation, use of cohorts or small groups, and symptom screening. This also aligns with what, with what we're seeing in the emerging literature about kids in COVID and COVID in schools. Um, there is a growing number of studies suggesting that these school-based countermeasures are effective. The governor discussed one of the modeling studies that informed our new measures. Another one that we looked at looked at the reproductive number, um, and that is you know, how many people um, a, an infected individual goes on to infect. When that number is at one, and that means that disease levels are stable, uh, not increasing, they're stable or possibly decreasing, reopening schools and the provision of in-person learning does not significantly increase community-wide transmission. Again, provided we have those health and safety measures. <clears throat> the governor has gone through the metrics. I do want to point out that we're encouraging local leaders to look at multiple things. We've talked about the case rates. You should also be looking at positivity and trends, um, as well as the broader health and benefits uh, to families um, in your community. As the governor said, this is a framework to phase in more students over time. We recommend starting small and building on success. Um, we recommend starting with younger students based on the science, but we recognize absolutely that there is a need to bring in students with special health or education needs regardless of grade level. Um, we do, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> when schools can demonstrate the ability to limit transmission and disease rates are flat or decreasing, we recommend that you keep going forward to bring in more and more students. Um, when disease rates are increasing, we recommend you take a pause on expanding to additional students 
but you are not, um, it, it is not needed that you revert, revert back to distance learning as long as you can limit transmission in the school. This brings me back to the importance of the health and safety measures and testing. Our new toolkit includes checklists for school administrators to use when deciding um, whether to resume, expand um, in-person learning in, in the K-12 environment, and will ensure that they have all of the space and staff and supplies and systems in place to limit transmission. We also want to make sure they have enough testing and contact tracing capacity within their community so that they are ready to respond when there are cases in the school environment. When, when disease rates are higher in the community, you can expect a higher number of cases um, to potentially be introduced in the school. We also today released guidance on COVID testing uh, for K-12 populations. This guidance includes a number of options um, for school and health leaders to decide on who, how, and when to test, and any district can use these tools. The governor mentioned our pilot. We have 11 districts in the pilot, and we're focused on providing same-day, low-barrier, no-cost testing to anyone with symptoms or close contacts, people who have been exposed to someone with COVID. This helps to identify cases, test, and do that contact tracing, and is really effective at mitigating outbreaks in schools. Many of these districts began their pilots this week. A few more will start in January because that's when their next expansion of in-person learning is. And these testing programs are designed in a way that they can be sustained in the long term and support broader testing goals in the community. Our hope is to quickly scale this to additional districts um, in January and as we learn more and go farther along on this journey. We are also um, planning after the first wave to release a playbook for schools that will have more specific and more detailed guidance on all of the ways you expand access to in-person learning, um, including through testing and contact tracing. I wanna wrap up by um, going back to our goal of keeping students, staff, their families and communities as safe as possible in the pandemic. That relies on all of us doing what we can to slow the spread of COVID-19. We are all connected and even those of us who don't have school-aged children at home and work in other sectors can play a role. We, need, we all need as Washingtonians to keep doing what we know works. Please wear your masks, watch your distance and limit your gatherings. This will help us get our rates down and get more children back in buildings sooner. Lacey, thanks for your, particularly your willingness to look at new data so we're not locked into the old ways always. And, and I think that's been very helpful here. I just want to comment a little bit about how to make this, this effort successful. This can't depend just on the Department of Health requirements. Those, as I've said, these are legal requirements. But it also depends on a secret ingredient in these school buildings, and that is the power of trust. Uh, in order for people to have confidence to return to the classroom, we need trust. And I was reading a conservative columnist this morning, Brett Stevens, is talking about with trust, you always have possibility without it, you don't. And speaking to any superintendent or school board, anything you can do to increase trust levels that, that these measures will be done safely is, is a necessary ingredient to success here. Anything you can do to communicate with the public to advise them when in our transmission cases and how they occurred and what you're doing and what you're doing to improve your protocols, that's gonna be extremely helpful uh, in this endeavor. Uh, so today we're joined by Dr. Daniel Zer, Medical Director of Infection Prevention and Chief of Pediatric Infectious Diseases for Seattle at Children's Hospital. Welcome, Dr. Zer. Appreciate your comments. Here, and I'm, um, thank you very much. I'm happy to be here and here representing the Washington chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics as well. And uh, as a Pediatrician, I have to recognize that school is critically important uh, to the development and the social emotional well-being of our children. And over the course of this pandemic, we have seen children suffer from being isolated at home and expect that they would continue to suffer in the absence of their peers, school-based caring adults, and supports and structure of the in-person and the work of our uh, youngest children uh, is to learn and interact and spend time in social settings. 
we know that they're not able to get this um, and, and meet their developmental needs through video classes. And children with behavioral difficulties and ac academic gaps and students in special ed programs need in-person time to reach their full potential. And throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, youth between the ages of 11 and 17 years have been more likely than other age groups to have moderate to severe symptoms of anxiety and depression. And in September of 2020, over half of 11 to 17 year olds reported having thoughts of suicide or self-harm nearly every day of the previous two weeks. So while uh, nothing is without risk, kids can be brought back to school in person safely through careful preparation and thoughtful sequencing appropriate to disease burden in the community, age of the students and other considerations. And evidence from the US de demonstrates to us that safe in-person schooling can be accomplished when the right precautions are in place. And while we are still learning about the susceptibility of school-aged children to SARS-CoV-2 infection and their role in community transmission, there is little evidence to indicate that schools have been a driver of community transmission in areas where schools have been held in person. Community transmission is an important consideration when we think about in-person education. We really need to prioritize doing the right thing outside of school so that we can bring our kids back to school. We have the tools available to help us make in-person schools safe for both students and teachers. These tools include um, what everybody has already said today, including staying home when ill, using appropriate PPE and face coverings, hand hygiene, physical distancing, especially for meals, improved ventilation, establishing smaller cohorts of students that stay together, and testing and contact tracing. We have learned critical lessons from schools that have already um, opened about how to support teachers and school personnel. And I think uh, now is time to use that information more broadly, prepare kids for return to school. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. We're so glad to have uh, medical geniuses allied in, in this <laughs> effort. Uh, we also have today Camas School District Superintendent Jeff Snell. Uh, thanks for joining us, Jeff. Looking forward to your comments. Uh, it's a privilege to be here and, and represent um, the district's um, great staff and amazing students that we have across the state and um, appreciate all the work that goes into um, putting together the guidance um, and the update to that guidance. Um, as we've seen over the last several months, um, we've learned a lot about processes and um, partnerships and really trying to rally staff, students, and our community around uh, getting students back into school. Um, I think one of the things you mentioned was trust and where we've seen great opportunity is um, from our staff, our bus drivers that have started with those early groups of small, uh, small groups of students. And, you know, when you first start it, it's a little nerve wracking. Um, everybody's a little scared. And then you start to realize that the mitigation strategies are in there for a reason and it's doable and that kindergartners will wear their masks. Um, and you start to build on that success. And so over the course of the last three months, we've been able to increase incrementally the number of students that are getting in-person uh, experiences, but that's varied across the state. And so um, with guidance like this, I think it allows us to um, really start to expand those services for students um, and work hand in hand with our staff uh, to really build that trust and also the trust of our parents and our families that they're sending us their most precious um, and we're going to do right by them and follow all those strategies and ensure that they are, um, that we're doing every week thing we can to be safe. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, you, you spoke about, and Superintendent Raikdal spoke about the amazing work that the teachers have done this, this fall. We have really pivoted an entire public school system and the learning that we've had through this, um, even though we would not choose it, our educators are, are prepared for the future. And so um, as quickly as we'd like to get to in-person experiences and the magic that happens in the classroom, we're not also gonna leave those skills behind. Um, and so I'm very excited and I know my colleagues are for the future of public education and, and where we can go with this. And it starts first by getting kids back into the classroom um, safely and incrementally. And so um, we're excited to get started. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Nance, about, you know, um, you said something that struck me about how, you know, the first time you do something, it can be very daunting. I think that applies probably everything in life. And I can certainly understand the first time a teacher would walk into a classroom after COVID 
with all these new protocols, you know, that has to be a concerning and, and somewhat daunting experience. And I think it's our job to make that as, as uh, safe, as reasonably competent as possible, and that's what we're trying to do here with these protocols that we're announcing. We're going to continue that effort. But I want to thank you and other educators who have been willing to take that step because it looks like many, many districts across the state have, and once people have taken the plunge, it's turned out well. It takes a little courage for that first step, though, and we ought to, we ought to respect that and honor that. Um, we have one final speaker before we turn to questions. Ryan Peterson is a school bus driver in Kennewick. He has been part of his local school district safety plan development, and Ryan has also been driving students to school every day this fall during the pandemic. Ryan, thanks for your work. Good afternoon, Governor Bransley. Thank you so much for having me. Um, like uh, the governor said, my name is Ryan Peterson. I'm a school bus driver, and I'm also the um, chapter president for the Kennewick School Bus Drivers Association. Um, I have been participating with our district administration and providing, uh, uh, ensuring that mitigation is put in place for dis disinfecting our buses um, and really learning and accepting kind of the work that the, the, the district is putting together um, to ensure that our buses are um, safe and ready for transport for our students. We've been welcoming our students um, uh, to the hybrid model of learning with an A uh, Monday, Tuesday uh, group and a B uh, Thursday, Friday group. And, and I can tell you that the, the challenges that, that our students are facing um, has really gone beyond and beyond what I would consider um, what I could do as a student uh, back in you know, the 1980s. Um, they're very, very resilient and, and doing a great job at that. Um, the mitigations in place uh, go from, um, you know, a electrostatic sprayer that comes in and sprays our buses in between routes, as well as making sure that our windows are open and our ventilation on the top of the roof of our buses is, is open for a positive airflow, keeping any potential viruses moving out of the bus versus um, within, within our bus. And, you know, our kids are great. They come in every morning and they, they're very excited to see um, see us, uh, pick them up, take them to school. Um, it's important to note in the Kennewick School District that th this is our elementary K through five. Our middle school um, and high schools are not open at this time, but they are looking at uh, ways to open them in the future. We are accepting um, students for um, special services, special needs, life skills, and any students that are just um, uh, not really um, able to uh, learn online, having difficulties, or might be disadvantaged youth um, that need that in-person learning and to, to really get that in-person learning. Um, you know, one of the great things about working in Kennewick is, is that um, whatever it seems to be that we need as a staff in order to ensure our safety and our students' safety, the administration has been very well responsive. Um, they have, you know, I, I, I brought up, uh, you know, uh, uh, hand sanitizers in one location of a building, and within, you know, three or four days, they all the stations were up and ready. So it's a matter of, you know, how, how best we can work together, both as a labor and management, to come together and make sure that the, the, the students have a safe and learning environment to learn in. Um, you know, and we just have done a really... Um, to me, a great job coming together as a community to help provide this education for our kids. And it's just been a real honor for me to work as a school bus driver and to help transport these children. And, and I know that we uh, will continue to work through this and um, come out uh, the other side with some very, um, you know, very well experienced young students who won't forget the work that we did to help provide them an education this year. Thank you, Ryan. You the educators, uh, from cooks to nurses to bus drivers to mechanics to engineers, and you're such a pivotal part of the whole educational community. Ryan, maybe you can keep your answer brief, but i got to ask you, when you started this, did you have some reservations about whether this was really wise to keep going in school? And if so, what helped you uh, surmount that concern? Well, you know... You always want to be there to serve your kids. That, that's why you're there is to go to school. And I had some reservations. Absolutely. I'm, I'm human. And most of us are human. But I think that one of the greatest things about um, my um, uh, 
letting go of some of those reservations is is the reassurance from from my transportation director and my colleagues that that really set a order in place for our students and and a process in place uh, for us and knowing that um, you know when we step off that bus somebody else is stepping on to disinfect it and then we'll come back that afternoon so it, they really did um, work with us to to help reassure us and making sure that it's a safe place to work. I think it reiterates the importance of the leadership in the schools to provide that assurance. So thanks for mentioning that. We do have another speaker, Sabrina Burr, who is uh, Seattle School District uh, Parent Teacher Association President. Sabrina, thanks for joining us. Um, thank you so much, uh, Governor. Actually, I'm not Seattle Council PTSA President. I'm a former president, 2016-2018. I'm the current strategic advisor for Seattle Council PTSA, and most importantly, I'm a Cleveland High School parent. Um, thank you for having me um, here today. Um, we're, we know that the most important thing is the health and safety of our children. But what we really need is consistent guidelines across all childcare and all educational spaces. We need flexibility and instructional hours, and we need financial support for transportation under social distancing. And that's very, very important. Um, as you know, our school districts um, have strong budget um, shortfalls because of COVID, and we need availability of testing in buildings, and we need dollars set aside for our ELL families. Um, it's very important, and even how we engage with our ELL families it's different. Um, it's, they're not gonna, we, we need to make sure that we're communicating and reaching them exactly where they are. And our students who are uh, experiencing homelessness, it's very important that we're meeting them where they are. And um, children who are in foster care, um, their situation is a lot different um, for us. Right now, mental health is just huge. We've had a student in Seattle Public Schools commit suicide. We've had a teacher in Seattle Public Schools commit suicide. We've had several parents. Our mental health of our kids are important. In Seattle, we only get nine counselors by the state, and we need restoration of, of, of funding around mental health. And I know that that was vetoed a while. Um, but the two most important things right now is to make sure how we work with COVID, um, that we are looking at a system level to have consistency to keep our kids safe. But part of their health and safety is their mental health. And so um, it's really important that we really focus on this. Um, some students, they are thriving online, but as you know, some are not. We've had many um, community meetings um, throughout um, all of our uh, regions in Seattle um, for our school board directors and families are across the map on where they feel. But the two things that we all agree on that comes across on every single call is making sure that we have the support around the safety um, for COVID, for testing and for all the costs that incur and also mental health supports. And those mental health supports are whether we're online or we're in buildings. Right now, we need that. Um, family engagement is the number one indicator of student success. And the fact that some districts have not been good at family engagement, that's another thing that this pandemic exposed. And so we really have to meet families where they are and help them to be our partner in this but it's really, really important that we worry about the safety of um, our most vulnerable and especially our families furthest from educational justice. I was on a call today with an African-American family that was being failed by a school system and their kids were um, making to feel that they were not important. Um, and so it's really important that we engage with families. And after that call, it was beautiful the solutions that they came with, but it would have not happened had we had had such consistent family engagement. So 
you know, I thank you for what you do, but um, we do know that the most valuable resource we have as Washingtonians is our children. And so we have to put them first and thank you for all that you do. Thank you, Sabrina, for your organization of advocacy. We really appreciate it. And we've had uh, a parent teacher association. We thought about having a student speak today because obviously they're the ones with the most at stake here, but, yeah. they're, but they're in school. But I do want to show you. Sure. could have had one. <laughs> to say my daughter gave you a reality check on the half, the half of all the Washington students uh, when she was in fifth grade. She's here. She's a. Uh, the Washington State NAACP Youth Council's first vice president. If we would have known that, she would have been able to come downstairs. So we'll, next we'll time, up, students' we'll voice is up, very important. We'll set up next time. We have been talking to students as mostly this morning before breakfast. Uh, I talked to a student at Eckstein School in the Seattle District, and he was giving me some ideas. Also, he was giving me some sort of uh, uh, some criticisms. He was courageous enough to criticize the governor. And as a result, I, I am asking if you can communicate with the Seattle School District is uh, for anybody named Inslee at Eckstein School, I hope that you'll double the homework for that student um, here in the next few weeks. But thanks for your leadership. With that, let's turn to questions. Sorry, just getting this pulled up. We will head to Sally Ho with AP. Go ahead, Sally. Uh, Hi there. Uh, Governor, I'd like to ask about teachers. Are teachers supported of this updated guidance and will they actually show up? What assurances or reassurance can you offer them on this? And will they be ahead of, in line for the vaccines? I am terribly sorry. I was distracted. Try that first part of that question again. <laughs> I wanted to ask you about teachers. Are teachers supportive of this updated guidance and will they actually show up? Well, I think there's a degree of, of viewpoint in educators. Uh, I think there's something they all share, which is if this can be done safely, they, they all would rather to be on-site learning because they're dedicated professionally to their kids and they know that that's the most successful thing to do. I think there are those are concerned about their student safety and their safety that still have questions about how to do this in a safe fashion. And I think that uh, some of them continue to have open minds to look at the uh, science and the experience, and we hope that they will. There's also a good number of the educators that are chomping at the bit right now and have already made a decision they'd like to get into the back in the classroom tomorrow. So I think there's a diversity of thought amongst educators at the moment. And it is our hope that if people have a, a fair-minded look at the evidence, uh, that they'll decide that this is good for their professional commitments and the students, which is their number one priority. And, and I believe that in part because I have a real soft part in my heart for, for teachers. You know, I'm, it's the family affair. My dad, my brother, my brother-in-law, my sister-in-law, some of my best friends. It's just the professional uh, commitment of these, this group of people is unparalleled to caring about, about their students. And I believe that. It's not shocking that there is concern. We're asking them to do something they've never done before, frankly. And so many of them do have uh, understandable concerns about that. But I can tell you, I would not have made this recommendation uh, to any teacher unless uh, I was willing to make it to my brother and to my brother-in-law and my sister-in-law. And it took me a while to come to this conclusion. And if I may, obviously the, the data and the scientific analysis is, is very important. And we've displayed some of this that we've got in the last six to seven months. But perhaps most impressive to me about the relative safety ability to do this is that there are so many districts that are doing it in schools. And I've come, I had a good discussion a few days ago with educators, and we listened to some of them who've had great success in their districts because they have found a way to do it safely and have had minimal in-school transmission as a result. So uh, we want to listen to educators. I know there'll be further dialogue. We hope that this will simply be a spark to dialogue in communities of everybody involved in this educational community. 
and we hope that the, we hope that that will succeed. As far as uh, whether teachers do come back, you know, that's a decision that will be made depending on those those discussions. But what I what I have seen is it's like anything new. I mean, I you know, and maybe this sounds not particularly philosophical. I remember standing on a little rock ledge with my brother, who is now a retired art teacher from up uh, up north, arguing about who was going to be the first one to jump into the lake up on Orcas Island. And we were kind of arguing who should jump first. I think he probably did because he was always braver than I was. But after you take that first jump, things to, tend to go well. And that is what the experience has been in these school districts, that people who've had concerns, once they see success, they get more confidence. We hope that that'll be the case. All right. All right. Up next, we'll go to Sarah Gensler with McClatchy. Go ahead, Sarah. This question is about the funding. So um, probably for Superintendent Rechtel, he's available for questions. But the $195 million that was already allocated directly to the district using the formula tied to the Title I program. Um, the three superintendents who spoke at a recent Ways and Means Committee meeting uh, made it clear that that wasn't enough to meet the increased cost of safety in the opening. Is this $3 million in CARES money specifically limited to paying for safety planning? Um, and does it need to be spent by the end of the year, or is it on the two-year timeline of that school-specific CARES funding? Well, um, we need to distribute it by the end of the year. It is related to the safety work that's already been done and considerable work has been done, and we're convinced it will be uh, appropriately distributed. So it is, it is certainly not all the needs of the school districts. They have a lot of transportation needs, and uh, we will be talking once we see what Congress does or does not do, uh, we will have discussions about what to do about potential additional educational funding. I will have discussions with legislative leaders in the next week. Uh, we hope that we will know by that time what Congress has done or has not done, and that will be able uh, enable us to assess what we can do for schools going forward. Superintendent Reichbill, did you want to add to that? Just briefly, the initial $195 million is out by formula. Um, despite the rhetoric of the current U.S. Secretary of Education, our state is poised to spend that down in the first eight or nine months, even though they have two years. You heard from Ryan, a bus driver who needs those facilities that he uses every day to transport students cleaned in between the PPE requirements. Um, there is a cost to this that is very, very real for districts, and they've got the resource now, but they're going to need additional help. Um, we, as the governor said, really hope that this next negotiation in Washington, D.C. delivers on the promise of maintaining those additional costs to the duration of the event. Even when we have a vaccine that begins to touch scale, we will still need to be wearing face coverings and doing the hand hygiene, and doing the work that is necessary to keep our students and our staff safe. So. Um, we're going to get through that money very, very quickly. Uh, we will need additional money. Hope the feds will, will come through. And if not, we'll work our tails off to partner with the legislature to get that done. All right. Up next, we'll go to Simone, Simone Del Rosario with Q13. Go ahead, Simone. Hi. Thank you for taking our questions today. Governor, teachers are not very high on the vaccination order as we've seen it. And I know there's still a lot of decisions to be made. Are you making any kind of push to get teachers higher up in this order, considering we know how important it is to get uh, kids back to school? Well, obviously, we'd like to do it as, you know, as soon as possible, because that could give people additional confidence. But we have a lot of hard decisions ahead of us about prioritization, and those have not been made. And that is the most important thing I can say today. Decisions have not been made uh, past the what's called a Section 1A. Those are the high-risk health workers, and uh, people in long-term uh, care facilities and uh, retirement homes and the like. So those are the only decisions have, that have been made. Uh, it is something that will be on my mind about uh, winning the confidence of educators as we make those decisions. We are looking forward, the federal government uh, will probably have their final draft of their uh, prioritization Hopefully this weekend will allow us then uh, to move forward. All right, all right. 
Up next, we'll go to Hannah Scott with Cairo Radio. Go ahead, Hannah. Hi, for the governor or, and or for Superintendent Rakedall, there are students who are likely going to fail, older students especially, uh, at least a year and not graduate on time because of remote learning. I'm wondering what policies are maybe being discussed to try to address that. Yeah, this is um, Chris, Chris Rakedall, State Superintendent. Districts are really active in this work right now. They needed to get through the first quarter of their traditional term to really understand what's happening. Um, you know, part of the urgency here, of course, is that we wanted to see what remote uh, delivery models look like. Again, some students having great success, teachers who have just worked unbelievably hard to build good environments for their students, but it is not for everybody. So we do have a lot of students struggling. Uh, you're seeing districts now reconsider uh, what it means to focus on essential learning standards. That guidance has been in place. Last year, we asked districts to prioritize their seniors, and we saw them just run through walls for their students. Um, they will do that again this year, and part of opening up schools increases that opportunity. Uh, but this is a bigger pipeline issue than just seniors. We will definitely focus on them, but there's now credit risk for lots of high school students. And in a system that is uh, pretty, pretty rigid, about 24 credits, we'll need the legislature to step up this year in ways they have been asked to for several years around flexing up 24 credits, not to diminish essential learning standards, but to give students more options to demonstrate their, their, their ability to uh, uh, to, to, to reveal their success in their academic learning. Part of that may go through the State Board of Education. They have sought a waiver of additional flexibility. Again, the legislature didn't grant that to them on a permanent status, so we are awaiting uh, policymakers as they come back. I hope it is an early action that they will provide districts. It is too difficult to plan all of the courses you need for second semester or third trimester in some districts if you don't have answers to what, what's possible now. Uh, this is part of the larger question I've been elevating about how can we make the system more responsive moving forward? We will face another crisis, um, and we can't wait eight or nine months between some of these decisions. We need to make executive decisions in a way that is meaningful and rapid in time. All right. Up next, we'll go to Jim Camden with a spokesman review. Go ahead, Jim. Yes, Governor, what recommendations would you give to school districts, parents, and students in areas that are way above that 350 cases per 100,000 population. For example, in Spokane, the latest numbers are 811 per 100,000 uh, as of yesterday. Uh, so what would you tell people in those situations? Well, we've, we've made these missions and we stand behind them and they basically suggest that uh, first off, if you are in on-site learning, these, these recommendations do not recommend closing down your school. That's important to say. So if you are having high schools open and you're demonstrating success already that you're not having, uh, you know, a big in-school transmission, we're not recommending you close down your school. Now, if you're considering opening up schools, as we suggested, even in these high numbers, and this is where the science has been pleasantly surprising, and this is where the experience of our schools has been pleasantly surprising, that particularly in the lower grades in elementary school, it is safe to open up your school if you maintain a proper safety of, and hygiene protocols. And the evidence is quite abundantly clear in this regard, even at these very high levels. So I speak a little bit as a parent and a grandparent in that situation, I would not hesitate uh, urging my grandchildren to go into, and they're in elementary school right now, to go back in these modified situations where you can return, uh, retain hygiene. Now to do that, because of the spatial limitations, many, probably most of the schools are in hybrid models so that they divide the children into smaller classroom units so they can maintain more space. So it's still not regular school as we know it. It might mean two days of on-site learning and two days of remote and one day to clean up, or it might be just morning where you, you divide up your school. Schools are doing this differently. But I, I will just tell you, even in those contexts, uh, I'm making a recommendation as a governor, but it is consistent of my, my, my opinion as a grandfather. Both of those are pretty important. Lacey, did you have anything you wanted to add? 
Um, just one quick addition that in, at any disease level, cohorting or putting uh, people into small groups is a protection. It's especially important when disease rates are higher, and that essentially limits the number of close contacts or likely exposures that um, will be there if somebody does have COVID-19. So, you know, in those higher disease communities where school is already happening, the governor is 100% right. You do not need um, to revert back to distance learning. Keep going, keep going forward. Um, and the use of cohorts in addition to all of the other health and safety protocols we've discussed are um, really essential. All right. Up next, we'll go to the Seattle Times with Dahlia Bazaar. Go ahead. Hi there. This question is for Governor Inslee. You've said there are legally binding health and safety protocols districts must follow to reopen. Why aren't these new disease metrics also legally binding as a minimum bar to reopen to more students? We're seeing significant differences in the scale of reopening between school districts in the same county based on the same set of metrics from the state. Well, because it's the way we thought we could successfully open the schools in a safe fashion. And we have some minimum requirements for safety, essentially in all contexts that make sense regardless of the, the situation. And those are consistent across the state of Washington. So we have a consistent health uh, uh, suite of, of safety standards that apply to all schools. Um, and so we wanted that approach that would be consistent on the minimum health standards. And again, I think there's a lot of confusion of what the governor's authority is or is not. A lot of folks think that I can push a green button and everyone has to go back to school. The governor's office simply does not have that authority to do that. But we do have the authority to have some minimum standards for health protocols. And again, I wanna say that we are gonna be insistent that they follow, they be followed. And there's a lot of reasons for that. One, it's the law, but two, it's necessary to win the confidence of parents and educators to come back into the classroom. And we will be diligent in being committed uh, to that position. Any more questions? All right, up next, we'll go to Natalie Swaby with King 5. Go ahead, Natalie. Go ahead and skip to the next one. We'll go to Kelly Azar with KATU. Actually, I think just had to drop. So we'll go to Melissa Santos with Casket. Go ahead, Melissa. Hi there, Governor. Hi, Governor. I know that you said that data has been driving this decision and we have new data that we didn't have months ago. But we did see in June, as early as June, Harvard experts put out 100 recommendations for how to safely reopen schools and saying it was imperative for students to do so. Why has this taken so long for you to come to this place when there has been some data suggesting how it can be done safely months ago? Because decisions when we have a, a, a critical threshold of enough data to become convinced of its propriety and one study was not enough, We've now looked at multiple evaluations of this situation, including people right here in Washington State. And again, I wanna reiterate, I think the most, to me, compelling evidence of this is the, not to diminish the importance of, you know, epidemiologists and virologists and pediatricians, but to me, the most convincing thing is the proof is in the pudding, which is all across the state of Washington. We have schools today that are operating safely with minimal transmission rates to the tremendous benefit of, of their children. To me, that is the capstone and the most persuasive evidence, and we now have this. And frankly, it's been very pleasantly surprising to me. So we're learning, and that's what a smart state does, and we've learned from, it, uh, from this really successful uh, experience. Yeah, a couple things. I come at this, you know, this is the ultimate a test of, of our state because the education of our children is the paramount duty of the state of Washington. And when I think about what we're asking educators to do here, I think of what educators have mean in my life, you know, Mr. Fotheringham and Mr. Heritage down in the Highline District and Mrs. Sawyer and Coach Walt Milroy and Ingram High School in the Seattle District. And, you know, they're pretty formative of my life 
And so I hope that as we go through this dialogue, people will approach this with respect for our educators, all of our educators, and what they mean and what we're asking them to do. And I also hope that we approach this with open minds. We're going to make good decisions if we approach things looking at the new evidence that we have. And those open minds are going to help us make a really good, some really good decisions in Washington State. And I want to thank everybody for engaging in that discussion. Until then, please be safe and uh, thank an educator for what they do. Take care.